Hi, in this lecture, we're going to start our study of vision with the anatomy of the eye. Now, just some background kind of interesting trivia about the eye. Did you know that about 70% of all the receptors in the body are in your eyes? That our eyes are made up of more than 2 million working parts, lots of cells in our eyeballs. You can try it, but you can't sneeze with your eyes open. And every time we blink, our eyes are closed for about three tenths of a second. So if you added it all up, we spend 30 minutes a day with our eyes closed. And the eye can distinguish 500 different shades of gray, which is pretty incredible if you think about it. So we're going to start with our um, kind of accessory structures of the eye, the things that you see pretty quickly when you look at someone. We're looking at the eyebrows, the eyelids, the conjunctiva or conjunctiva the lacrimal apparatus, and some of these eye muscles. So obviously we have eyebrows, right? Um, we should have two, you might have one. Just a little joke there about the unibrow. But basically eyebrows are there to protect our eyes, shade our eyes, you know, they help prevent sweat from dripping into our eyes. So that's pretty self-explanatory. If we look at our eyelids, right, our eyelids have eyelashes to kind of help close and protect our eyes. And then we have these glands on the inside um, of our eyelids. They're called tarsal glands. You can kind of see in this picture, one here and down here. And so these are going to make a lipid type of material and it prevents them from sticking together. So it's just a secretion for that. And then obviously our eyelids protect our eye, right? We can close our eye and protect our eye from any kind of trauma or damage to them. Um, now, if we look between the eyelids, you have this thing called the lacrimal caruncle. I always call that the little thing that looks like a zit in the corner of your eye. That actually has some glands that make additional secretions for our eye. And these glands, glands make a very thick secretion and it can be kind of gritty. If you have ever slept really long and you wake up and you rub your eyes and you feel like that sandy, I guess that's where they talked about the sand man coming. I don't know. It's probably a scary movie that I didn't need to reference, but you might feel those sandy, gritty deposits. Those come from the lacrimal caruncle, which is that piece there. Now, you can say conjunctiva, and I've heard it pronounced conjunctiva. This is a mucous membrane. If you look at your eye, if you look at the visible portion, it looks kind of shiny. It's a mucous membrane. It basically protects our eye from things in our environment, dust, etc., and it covers the eye and the inside of the eyelids. You've probably heard of conjunctivitis or pink eye. So um, when it gets infected or inflamed, it gets red and pink inflammation. It can be painful. Um, sometimes it's usually bacterial, it can be highly contagious. So you usually get some eye drops um, to apply for that. The lacrimal apparatus, lacrimal is tears. So this is a, an apparatus and it consists of several structures and the whole point of this is to make the tears distribute the tears we want them to be washing and bathing our eyes and also remove them so it starts with the lacrimal gland and the lacrimal gland is easily seen on our models or your tear gland but we have to call lacrimal gland this is where the tears are made it makes it, it releases them through these ducts. So you'll see these things coming down. These are the lacrimal ducts, right? It's an exocrine gland. So the tears are drained onto the eyeball where they wash across the eye. And as they wash across the eye, they're drained into these openings. And these openings are called the puncta or punctum. And they're like little holes. And so they're just a tiny little pinprick hole that's going to collect the tears and then the tears drain into the hole through these little canals called lacrimal canaliculi, and then that sends it into the lacrimal sac. So that's collecting all those tears that are constantly washing over your eye. And then from the sac, they drain down the nasal lacrimal duct into your nasal cavity. So you might notice that when you cry, those tears actually you know, spill out into your nose, and you might notice that your nose runs, you know, these salty tears. So this is one of the models we look at in lab, and you can see the lacrimal apparatus on this model. To begin with, you can see the lacrimal gland pretty easily on the model. And then remember that the lacrimal gland is the exocrine gland, so you can see the little ducts here draining the tears. The tears will wash across the eyeball. And then on the model, it looks like a little black circle. That's all you get on this model. That's the puncta or punctum. Those are the holes. And from there, the tears drain into the lacrimal canaliculi. 
Remember, these canals are going to drain the tears into the lacrimal sac. So you can see those structures on this eye model. Now, you don't have to memorize all the different types of tears. I do want you to know this first one, like what's in our tears. And so we have a lot of water, there's mucus, there's electrolytes, they're salty. There's lysozyme, which is basically an antibacterial enzyme, helps clean our eyes. And there's even enkephalin. So tears are extremely important to constantly moisten and lubricate and protect our eye. If you've ever had dry eyes, you know it's irritating, right? Because we're constantly blinking, there's movement going on. So we need that lubrication. And it also helps protect our eye with the lysozyme. Now we release enkephalins. Enkephalins are, are natural opiates, right? Like beta endorphins. So if you cry or when you cry, you usually feel better afterwards. There's the, so these tears are mainly called like our basal tears. These are the ones that are there all the time. Just FYI, reflex and emotional. So reflex tears are like when you're cutting an onion and you start to tear up or in the wind. And then emotional tears, right, from sadness um, or even happiness. We can have emotional tears that are formed. Now, as far as the extrinsic eye muscles, there's six. They're controlled by three cranial nerves. You might remember these were all motor cranial nerves. Now, you don't have to memorize all these nerves again, but this I wanted you to see why you learned them. Um, the, there's four rectus muscles. Remember, rectus means straight. So there's one on top, and there's one below, and then there's a medial and a lateral. Well, the way you can tell medial and lateral is that that lacrimal apparatus that we looked at, let's go back up to this view. Notice that that lacrimal gland is on the lateral aspect of the eye and you'll see the, la the uh, lacrimal gland on almost all the eye models anyway, so that'll help you. There's two obliques, meaning they come in at an angle. There's an inferior oblique, see how it kind of wraps around underneath the eye. Notice it's going to insert below the lateral rectus. So if you find the lateral rectus on the model, you'll see the inferior oblique muscle underneath it. And on most of our models, we just see this superior oblique tendon as it crosses over the top of the eye. So here's the back of one of our eye models. So you can see the superior rectus here, and then below you can see the inferior rectus. Once I find the lacrimal gland, I know that this one is my lateral rectus muscle, which means that the one on this side has to be the medial rectus. As far as the obliques, it's cut. So there's my inferior oblique. So remember to find it, I just look for the lateral rectus and below it, and then this is the tendon of the superior oblique. So we can see these eye muscles. Now, if we look at an actual eyeball, it has three layers. So it's an outer layer, a middle, and an inner. The outer is called the fibrous tunic. The middle is called the vascular tunic, so that's telling you that's where the blood vessels are. And the inner is the neural tunic, so that's where the neurotransmitters, excuse me, the neurotransmitters. That's where your rods and your cones are. That's where that nerve impulse and those photoreceptors are going to be. So in this view, you can see the outer part of the eyeball is the fibrous tunic. They're coloring kind of like this yellow-orange, kind of, I guess it's this yellow color here is the middle, and then the orange is representing the inner. So the fibrous tunic has a couple things to learn. The out of it is the outside is called the sclera. So the sclera is the white of the eye. You can see it. All of the eye muscles insert on the sclera. Now the very front, what you see, the visible portion of your eye is the cornea. And it's clear. It's called a window to the eye and so it covers the front. So they say that the cornea covers one sixth of your eye. So if you see the visible portion of your eye, that's one sixth of your whole eyeball, if you're curious how big the eye is. But this whole anterior part is covered by the cornea. Now the cornea is protection and it's a window. It lets light in. It has a lot of nerve endings, right? If you touch the cornea, it causes a blinking reflex. But because it's the most exposed part of your eye, it is vulnerable to damage and it hurts if you've ever scratched your cornea. Right? It can be very, very painful. Now the choroid is the middle layer. So in this picture, it's this kind of reddish color. And this has the blood vessels. That's why it's called the vascular layer. It also has structures that control how much light enters the eye. So for example, the lens is part of the middle portion of the eye. And because it's pigmented, when light comes in, it prevents it from bouncing and scattering all over the place.
So if we look at the lens, it's surrounded by something called the ciliary body. And the ciliary body, this is obviously an eye muscle cut, eyeball cut in half. You'll see a little piece of it on the top and a little piece on the bottom. And it's connected to the suspensory ligaments, which usually look like little white strings to the lens. So it circles the whole lens. So in this view here, you can see the lens in the middle and you can kind of see the ciliary process or ciliary body around it and then you can see all the ligaments. So what it does is it can allow the lens to kind of flatten out a little bit or to constrict because our lens has to change its size depending on if we're looking at things up close or things far away. Now there's something called the aura serrata which you can kind of see this radiating area and that's just the anterior portion of the retina kind of where it meets the anterior portion of the eyeball. Now the iris is the colored portion of your eye. So we only have melanin here, but it varies in the amount of melanin, the distribution of melanin. There's some really cool pictures of human irises online um, that really kind of incredible with the distribution of the pigment. Um, but what the iris is actually is kind of two muscles. There's a muscle that can constrict to basically constrict the pupil. And there's a muscle that opens up, right, to dilate the pupil. So we know this is under control of our autonomic nervous system. We remember that our sympathetic division is going to dilate, right, the pupil. So whenever that is activated, our pupils dilate or get bigger. And this also happens in the dark, in dim light, because you're trying to let more light in. Our parasympathetic is going to constrict the pupil, and our pupil also constricts in bright light. And you might remember we did some cranial nerve testing. Do you remember which cranial nerve did this? Well, you said three, ocular motor. And so that's the, the job of the iris is to constrict or open up. So you can see that a little bit better in this picture. The dilator muscles will, will contract to basically pull it open, whereas and you have a nice big pupil there, or they can constrict. And it's mainly due to control the amount of light that gets into your eye. Now, the retina is the neural part. The retina has photoreceptors, and the photoreceptors are called rods and cones. So we're going to be focusing on this in another lecture when we really look at the physiology of vision. But what you have to know right now is just that we have rods and cones. So there are two types of photoreceptors. And our rods are the ones that mainly work for like dim, like dark, dark vision, I guess. I don't know, that's a real word. And dim light. So at night when you turn all the lights off, um, they give us our different like shades of gray, whereas our cones are the ones that are going to function for our bright color vision. We'll talk more about those. Now there's a third relay cell in here. You can kind of see these blue cells. These are called ganglion cells. And we will talk more about those um, in our physiology lecture. But just know these are our photoreceptors, or our rods and our cones. Our rods give you like the fuzzy vision, like I mentioned, the dim light or peripheral vision. So if you put your hand up to the side, you can still see your hand, but it's fuzzy. Whereas you bring it in front, you can see it clearer now. And that's your cones. So your cones give what's your best visual acuity, um, color vision, crispness of vision. Um, so our, our best um, vision is really done through our cones. Now, the cones have a higher threshold, which is why you need light when your cones work. So if I were to turn all the lights out, you won't see colors, right? Think about it, if you turn the lights off at night, you only see basically these shades of gray. There's three different colors of cones. They're red, blue, and green. And so they're going to be stimulated by different wavelengths of light. So see the light comes through the cornea, and then it goes through the lens, and it's gonna to come to a specific area on the back of the eye, which I'll talk about in just one second, where we have our best like visual acuity. And that area is called the fovea. So if we look at this picture of the eyeball, in the back of the eyeball is this area. On a lot of our models, it's colored yellow. It looks like a little yellowish circle called the macula lutea, or you can see macula lutea. Now, right dead center of it, there's this little dot on our models. It's called the fovea centralis. So the fovea centralis is an area on the retina that only contains cones. Remember, cones are our best for vision, right? Crisp vision, color vision. So light, automatically focuses on the fovea. I call it the sweet spot. 
for vision. So when you're looking at something and those light waves are coming in, they come through the cornea and they hit the lens and the lens's job is to focus all of those light waves right on that phobia because that's where we're going to get our best vision. So no matter whenever you look at something, the light is automatically hitting the phobia and you see it. Now, the fovea only contains cones, so I don't know if you've ever gone out stargazing at night, but if you go out and you're looking at some stars that are really far away, um, and if you look right at them, they disappear. I don't know if you've ever tried it. You should try it. And so it's kind of crazy because you're looking for them, and then you look, and they're gone. And the only way you see them is to look to the side. Well, what happens is whenever we look directly at something, we're focusing light on that fovea. But if we look to the side of it, now we're gonna well, now we're going to focus light on the side of the fovea where we have the rods and the rods are what we're going to use to see in the dark and see at night so that's why we can see it if we look to the side because we're forcing light now to focus on the side of the fovea and not hit the fovea so it's kind of cool and we'll talk a little more. We have another lecture on the physiology of vision. There's the um, optic disc. And what you'll see here are these are all axons. And the optic disc, there's no photoreceptors. See in this picture, you can see your rods and cones out here. And these are all photoreceptors. Nothing here. So if light focuses on the optic disc, we call it the blind spot, you can't see anything. And so we have that activity in lab where you can move and you can force light to hit the blind spot and it literally disappears because there's no way you can see it if there's no receptor. Now, attached, detached retina is when the retina starts to fall away from the eyeball. It can happen from trauma, um, head trauma, it can do sports, accidents, etc. cetera. And um, what people say is it's like a window going down. They just slowly lose their vision because the retina is held in place with fluid, which we'll look at shortly, but if it becomes detached, that's an emergency because if they can't reattach it, you're going to go blind. Now, we mentioned the choroid was the vascular layer. It prevented light from scattering, and it has all the blood vessels. You ever do a picture and you see that red eye bouncing back? This is the back of your eyeball. So if you do an exam and you do the ophthalmoscope and you look in the back, you can see a little bit of the macula and the fovea, and you can see the blind spot. But it's very, very vascular. So all that red is just the return, right, of the picture of the, of the light hitting the blood. And so when you do a, when you see the red eye, what you're seeing is the back of their eyeball, because that's what it looks like from the light. Now, here's one of our models where we can look briefly at some eye anatomy. Um, obviously, I think the lens is pretty obvious on this one, but notice that you also see those suspensory ligaments. And I'm just going to abbreviate for this right now. I see my optic nerve, which is cranial nerve number two. So that area where it meets the eyeball is going to be my optic disc. I see the cornea, which is just a piece of plastic on this particular model. The choroid, this one's our nesting model. So the choroid comes out, and you can see that brownish pigmented. You can see the iris here. We have blue eyes on this model. You can see the sclera as well. Remember, that's the white of the eye. And then this inside is going to be the retina. It's kind of like a peach color. Now, this is that aura serrata, which is the edge of the retina. And then this is my ciliary body. You can see a piece of it here and a piece of it here connected to the suspensory ligaments. So you can see some of the structures um, of the eyeball here. Here's our other eye model. Notice you see this yellow circle right there. That's the macula. The 18 or the 8 is actually on the fovea centralis. Notice you can really see that aura serrata. It's this whole piece of black here. And the retina is the yellow layer. Now, this eyeball is a little bit different because it's hard to see the choroid. You can see the sclera, no problem, right? The white of the eye. But the choroid is actually, as far as the layer, it's that brownish layer. Now, you will see a lens. You'll see the cornea. It's just the piece of plastic. And the pupil is just the hole on the model. You can actually put your finger in it when you take the model apart.
So there's something called macular degeneration that you might have heard of before. Um, unfortunately, this is common with um, diabetes mellitus because it can happen from damage from excessive blood glucose levels. So remember the macula is that little yellowish area and the fovea was right inside. So if it becomes damaged, you can have bleeding, you can get scar tissue. And what happens is it changes your vision and the amount of vision depends on the damage. And so a lot of times people with um, diabetes mellitus that might have issues with it, um, there's surgeries they can do to kind of clean off those excessive blood vessels. And I mentioned the detached retina, but I wanted to show you a picture of it. So let me move myself out of the way. Um, so again, the retina kind of like falls apart or it pulls loose. And then where the, re where the retina is detached, there's darkness. You can't see anything because it's not attached to send that impulse from the um, photoreceptor. So that's what you'll, it would look like. And it's an emergency to get that um, put back again. Now, another thing is we talk about these layers of the eye, but inside the eye, it has these chambers and there's fluid inside the eye. So I use the lens or use the lens as your landmark. We have a big chamber behind the lens called the posterior chamber or posterior segment. That's very, very large. And then we have one in front of the lens, which is the anterior chamber. The posterior chamber is filled with real thick fluid called vitreous humor or the vitreous body so humor needs means fluid and so what it does remember is it transmits light so when light is coming through right it hits the cornea and then it hits the lens and it's going back to the fovea it has to pass through all this fluid so light gets passed through it to the fovea it also helps push on and support that retina and hold the retina in place to prevent that retina detachment and it contributes to the pressure inside your eye I don't know if you've heard or ever had a floater before, but floaters, they look real, right? You'll see something just kind of floating by your eye and they're, they're just debris in the vitreous body. So as they float by, they cast a shadow on the fovea. So it looks like there's something there, but it's not. It's in your vitreous humor and they can be fairly common. Now the anterior chamber is filled with a thinner, more watery fluid called aqueous humor and it's formed and drained continuously. Uh, so there's little holes. We're not, we didn't learn the names of these sinuses, but they drain the aqueous humor. So it's constantly produced and drained to keep it at the same pressure. If this fluid accumulates, it can cause a condition called glaucoma, which we'll get to shortly. But this is also important for providing nourishment to the cornea and the lens because the cornea and the lens are both avascular. So they do not have have a blood supply and they need to get the nutrients from somewhere so they get it from the aqueous humor. Just interesting fact, since they don't have a blood supply, you can transplant these without worry of rejection because it's the immune system that rejects the organ. Those cells, well, those cells got to get there through the blood. So there's no way for them to get there. So they're both avascular structures. Now, glaucoma, you've probably heard of this, is an increase in intraocular pressure. So the pressure goes up. Usually it's an issue in the um, anterior compartment where the drainage of that fluid doesn't happen and then the whole eyeball, right, you increase pressure. Well, as you increase pressure, it's gonna damage those photoreceptors and that retina. And what typically happens is you start to lose your peripheral vision first and get tunnel vision. It can be genetic. Um, it's important to, when you have your annual eye exam, they'll do a quick um, test on your intraocular pressure because if they catch it early, they can treat it and you don't become blind. And then our last structure that you know we're looking at here is the lens. And the lens is biconvex. That just means it kind of sticks out on both ends. It's clear because the light goes through it. We said it's held in place with suspensory ligaments. And remember, they're going to either allow it to elongate and flatten or constrict. And the lens's job is to focus that light on the sweet spot. It needs to focus it on the fovea. So we mentioned that the lens is avascular, um, but something that can happen are called cataracts. So you can see a normal clear lens in this image and then look at this one with cataracts, especially you can see them sometimes, um, especially if you have like a really old dog, you might see them. 
they're common, they happen in humans, they happen in animals. And so what happens is you get these cloudy deposits inside the lens and then it interferes with vision. One of the main causes of cataracts is UV radiation. So it is important to shield your eyes and wear sunglasses. It happens with aging as well. Um, and sometimes they can be lasered and they can be removed. So this concludes our lecture on the anatomy of the eye. And we'll talk all about the physiology of vision in our next lecture.